Hello and welcome back to Unheard, I'm Florence Reed. The software mogul turned philanthropist Bill Gates is often held up as the prime example of a good billionaire. He has, by his own account at least, saved millions of lives across the world and changed the face of charity forever. In a brand new book that I hold in my hands, which I've been reading this week, investigative journalist Tim Schwab squarely takes aim at the Gates Foundation and asks if one of the richest men in the world is quite what he seems. He joins me now to get into it. Tim, welcome to Unheard. Thank you so much. Great to be here, Florence. It's easy to forget that in the early days of Microsoft, Bill Gates had a reputation as an accelerationist, someone who was ruthless in leading that company to success. But then in the year 2000, it seemed after the lawsuit from the US government for monopolizing that tech industry, he had a road to Damascus moment and started the Gates Foundation. Is that an accurate representation of events? Yeah, I think it's easy to imagine that there are two Bill Gates. There's the, uh, the corporate titan and the bully who ran Microsoft. And then there's the kind-hearted, soft-spoken philanthropist today at the head of the Gates Foundation. But I think that's a mistake. It's a mythology to imagine that there's two different Bill Gates. Um, he really clearly is the exact same person who ran Microsoft. And his philanthropic career makes a lot more sense if you understand him in that way. So given you've spent the last few years in the company of a huge amount of information about Bill Gates, people who worked for him and people who like him, don't like him so much, it seems. Tell me, what is your evaluation of the man himself? What is this character, this core character that has stayed continuous throughout his life? I think Bill Gates is a man driven by hubris. He believes that he is right and righteous in everything he does, uh, the smartest guy in the room and a man born to lead. And you know, with his philanthropic career, I don't doubt that he's well-meaning in the sense that he thinks he's helping the world. But he's helping the world the only way he knows how, which is by taking control. And so in his mind, he is the best person to take control of these institutions and these decision-making processes that have led to him having an inordinate amount of responsibility for different sectors, more than perhaps any other billionaire on the planet. Yeah, absolutely. You know, again, it's easy to mistake what he's doing as this kind of innocent, unimpeachable philanthropy. But at the end of the day, it's really an exercise of political power. Um, the Gates Foundation and Bill Gates have become some of the most important influencers and shapers of a great many different public policies, from public health to public education. Now, Bill Gates is claiming expertise and authority on climate change. He's talking more and more about AI and how we regulate AI. And yes, he is giving a lot of charitable donations and making these philanthropic gifts. We have to understand that he's not donating money as much as he is buying influence. And at the end of the day, this model really boils down to the richest guy taking the loudest voice. Through philanthropy, he's able to turn his vast wealth into political influence over the way the world works for the rest of us. OK, let's stop there and make a quick distinction. How is the way in which Bill Gates is giving money? You say that he's not simply donating money, he's buying political influence. How is the way in which he is donating money distinct from, for example, myself giving some of my salary to a donkey sanctuary? How is it different when Bill Gates does it? It's different in a few different ways. One is simply the difference of magnitude or scale. Um, I mean, Bill Gates can quite literally plant his flag and claim dominion over an entire corner of public policy. Areas like malaria or tuberculosis, he's become one of the most powerful shapers and influencers of African agriculture. It's a level of influence that you and I don't have because we don't have that, that kind of money. And the Gates Foundation isn't going out into the field to talk to his intended beneficiaries, asking them about their needs and desires and their wants. The Gates model operates very differently. Uh, Bill Gates is at the Gates Foundation's half billion dollar headquarters in Seattle with his army of consultants and experts and pharma alum. And they sit in a war room and they figure out what problems are worth Bill Gates' time and money and what the best solutions are. And then they go out and fund NGOs, think tanks, universities, political advocacy groups, the news media, and they can get an entire field or most of an entire field rowing in the same direction. And that creates a powerful current that's difficult for critics or detractors to row against. So, you know, th this word monopoly really does hound Bill Gates' philanthropic career. It's come up several times in news articles. And many of the people who know the foundation best will describe it really as, as 
you know, eager to exercise power almost in a bullying way. Okay, though, of course, in this situation, we have to create some sort of moral distinction between a monopoly in the corporate world, the kind of monopoly he had in the 90s with Microsoft, and a monopoly in the world of charitable giving. There is, of course, two very different outcomes to that money. Okay, yes, you might say he does accrue political sway, but he is not profiting off the back of the Bill Gates Foundation like he was in the same way with Microsoft. Right. The Gates Foundation is incorporated as a non-profit, tax-privileged uh, private foundation. Um, so, no, I, I've never argued that Bill Gates would use the Gates Foundation to drive personal profits, to drive his personal wealth. At the same time, one could still see ways that the Gates Foundation's work might overlap with, with Bill Gates' um, personal financial interests. You know, the Gates Foundation, for example, has been a leading advocate on patent rights for pharmaceutical companies. Um, and by strengthening the patent rights for pharmaceutical companies, one could also see an indirect benefit, for example, to Microsoft, whose profit margins very much turn on the same concerns about intellectual property. So there's an overlap there that I don't think is driven by financial interest, but by ideological interest. You know, Bill Gates has a pretty classically neoliberal model of social change, which is uh, the primacy of the private sector, corporate partnerships, public-private partnerships, market-based solutions, technology and innovation is a solution to everything. So there is a way, I think it bears scrutiny, the ways that the Gates Foundation's work. Uh, it, it's worth following the money, and I do think it bears scrutiny, to examine the way those ideologies and those finances can overlap at times. I wouldn't say it's the case that Bill Gates is creating this massive charitable empire to, to enrich himself. Eventually, Bill Gates won't be with us anymore, and his legacy has been inordinately enriched by the last 10 years, 20 years of uh, investment in humanitarian causes. So I suppose there is an argument there about a different kind of enrichment. I suppose here we have to get on to, though, the question of how exactly he is developing these kind of micro monopolies in different areas of life. You mentioned there pharmaceuticals, which is perhaps what he's best known for, childhood vaccination being a good example. So Bill Gates loves vaccines. He describes them as magic. He describes them as miracles. One reason that Bill Gates likes vaccines is because they're so similar to computer software. You put a lot of time and energy and research and development to producing the vaccine, and then it can be manufactured and distributed relatively cheaply, sort of like a Microsoft Windows diskette uh, back in the day, if you're old enough to remember those days. Um, so, you know, the vaccine market and pharmaceutical markets are pretty similar to software markets. And so maybe it's not a surprise that the Gates Foundation has put a great deal of time and energy and money. It's actually billions, tens of billions of dollars that the foundation works on, on, on areas like public health and development. Vaccines are vital vaccines save lives. And it is true that the Gates Foundation has helped support a number of organizations that have put more than a billion vaccines into the arms of the global poor. We know that that does save lives and that does improve lives. However, it's a very narrow conception of public health. It's a pharmaceutical driven uh, approach to public health. There are a lot of ways to save lives in public health. You can build clinics, you can train doctors, you can build roads that help people in distant villages get to clinics in urban areas. Um, and the problem with the Gates model is that He's fundraising, one problem is that he's fundraising much of the money that fuels his charitable projects from us taxpayers. So Gates' signature project with vaccines is an organization called Gabi. Gabi was founded by the Gates Foundation, with seed money from the Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation sits on the boards, on the board of directors. But the vast majority of money for Gabi actually comes from us taxpayers. Um, this is a private institution. There are a few checks and balances or transparency around Gabi. So there's a real question for all of us. Um, I think there's a real trigger of accountability because this project at the Gates Foundation and many other projects really depends heavily on our money, on taxpayer funds, and we should have some basic accountability for it. How does it happen that someone with so much money as Bill Gates does ends up using the money of, of a taxpayer? That doesn't make much sense. It's one of an endless number of paradoxes that define the Gates Foundation today. So many of its pr largest charitable interventions are organized as public-private partnerships. Again, the Gates Foundation gets the project off the ground, provides the seed money, 
But then you'll see Bill and Melinda French Gates personally traveling all over the world in this fundraising effort that is essentially lobbying. It's reorienting uh, the national budgets of sovereign nations, uh, the aid budgets, to go towards charitable projects over which the Gates Foundation has outsized influence. So there, I think we are really long overdue for a new era of accountability and a day of reckoning to step back and say, you know, yes, vaccines are important and vaccines save lives. We should be funding them. But there are a lot of different ways to, to, to address the vaccine issue. Uh, there are more and less efficient ways to, to develop and to distribute vaccines than the, than, the, than the pathway that Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation have chosen. And bigger than that, there are a lot of different ways to think about global health beyond the distribution of pharmaceuticals, of drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. So it's just, we're right for a, a new conversation about this. So correct me if I'm wrong there, but it seems that Bill Gates and Melinda Gates to a lesser extent have become kind of charitable influencers. They are guiding where not only their money goes, but, but the money is of incredibly wealthy nations. In that case though, wouldn't we want someone, given how bloated and I suppose useless many of the government bureaucracies we know to be, wouldn't we want someone like Bill Gates to step in with his army of consultants to advise well on where taxpayers' money should go? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It's a question we could debate. I think it gets down to our own conception of democracy and social change and, and what we believe. You know, my own belief is that I would rather have taxpayer dollars housed in an in institution like a government that is accountability, that is subject to public records requests, that is subject to transparency requirements, that can be voted in or out depending on how good or bad a job it does. I mean, the other option is um, it's a political future where a small number of extremely wealthy tech billionaires play a larger and larger role in, in governance and world affairs. You know, the book I wrote is about the Gates Foundation and Bill Gates, but it's really a case study for this larger problem of extreme wealth. When we allow people to become this wealthy, like Bill Gates is, he's currently, I think, $117 billion is in his private bank account. Um, we know that that's more money than they could ever spend on themselves. So we know that they will use it for political purposes if not for lobbying and campaign contributions and political advocacy, then through philanthropy, as Bill Gates has shown. It's, it's very easy, especially, you know, I'm an American, and it's very easy to look at Washington and sort of the swamp that's there and, you know, all of the, um, the sort of retrograde political figures who are running the government right now. But I just feel like there's a certain political fatalism if we don't say, well, you know, democracy is messy and it's maybe not in its finest form right now. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be optimistic and we shouldn't fight for a stronger democracy. We have to here think about what is the better alternative. I think we can come to greater questions about capitalism and, and its many faults um, as we go on. But what is the alternative to allowing someone like Bill Gates to create these kind of micro monopolies of influence using his vast wealth? I suppose the opposite is a billionaire who goes and sits on his desert island, puts his feet up, drinks a pina colada, and we never hear from him again. You don't see many books written about those billionaires. So is it really a good idea to disincentivize the richest in our society from attempting to be philanthropists? I mean, I think we could think in even bigger political terms, like, do we need billionaires at all? Should billionaires exist? Sure, but billionaires do exist. Whether we like it or not, they do exist. So we have to think about what we're going to do with the billionaires we've got. Well, one thing we could do with the billionaires we got is to tax them. Is to, you know, in the United States, there's a growing debate around a wealth tax where you take a certain percentage of their acquired wealth every year. You know, there's no reason why we couldn't aim our, you know, our political energy at that cause rather than thinking about should they give away their money or sit on a, a desert island? I mean, I guess one caveat I would say is that, I mean, if you do want to ask that question in that narrow terms versus, you know, the desert island scenario or the philanthropist, you know, someone like Bill Gates, it's just really important to remember that he's not giving away money. He's exercising political influence. Um, so it's either do we want a billionaire to use the vast wealth to exercise political influence or do we want them to sit quietly on the desert island? And I think that sort of reframes that question. Another industry of which Bill Gates was not raised with a particular knowledge, but seems to have taken on the mantle as our 
expert in chief is farming and agriculture. He is the greatest landowner of farmland in America and has had a huge effect on the agricultural industry of Africa and India. Tell me more about that. So this is an area that once again, it's it's underfunded, it's underdeveloped. If you're looking at um, the Gates Foundation's work throughout the African continent on agricultural development. Um, so pretty early in the Gates Foundation's tenure, they started talking about uh, bringing a new green revolution to Africa. They promised they would cut hunger in half and double yields. They would dramatically increase farmer incomes. So the Gates Foundation literally promised a revolution and the revolution did not arrive. Um, here we are nearly two decades later, billions of dollars spent by the Gates Foundation. Again, um, it's really organized and kind of a corporate approach of trying to industrialize African agriculture, essentially to make it look more like the United States, where it's an input intensive, chemical intensive style of agriculture. So it hasn't really worked for the Gates Foundation. Today, you have independent experts who are you know, looking at the outputs of Gates charitable inventions and showing they have not delivered what they promised. But more than that, you have Gates' intended beneficiaries, um, farmer groups across the African continent who are now explicitly calling on the Gates Foundation to end its charitable crusade because they're saying it's taking agricultural development in the wrong direction. When you have independent experts and your own intended beneficiaries challenging your charitable interventions, you know, I think a reasonable, accountable, and legitimate uh, structure of power would think twice about what they're doing. But the Gates Foundation's response has just been to double down. And this is kind of a characteristic hubris or arrogance you see in its work, where they feel entitled and privileged to keep throwing the dart, collateral damage and opportunity costs be damned. Um, and this is an important problem with the Gates Foundation, just that it has so much money, it can keep solving problems if it wants to, even if their solutions aren't working, or even if the solutions are even hurting the very people it claims to help. It's not very neoliberal of him to ignore the advice of his technocrats, though, surely? I mean, I think it's fair to say that the Gates Foundation's model is, is well-defined as very colonial. You have this billionaire in Seattle who has a very narrow idea about how to fix a problem, and he can go into you know, these very poor nations across places like Sub-Saharan Africa and really have an outsized voice in shaping you know, everything from agricultural policy to vaccine policy. Do you think he's getting advice though from these technocratic types that is telling him actually know what you're doing in the long term will work? Or is it that he's actually gone rogue and is on a solo mission to kind of create his own legacy? Yeah, I think this starts to get at a very complex discourse around decolonization. The people that Gates is, it's not that Gates isn't talking to people in these poor nations, is that the people he's talking to and working with went to the same elite schools that Bill Gates and all of his partners in Seattle went to. And you see this across a lot of the Gates Foundation's work where it's less of a puppeteer pulling strings and more of a just kind of a neoliberal mind meld where every, it's just the water that all of these, the, the Gates Foundation and its partners are all swimming in. They're all thinking in the same kinds of ways around market-based solutions. So, you know, that's how they arrive at the solutions they do. So when people come to conspiratorial conclusions about Bill Gates, that he sat alone in an office making decisions about the future of the world, you're saying they're actually, they need to be less worried about that and more worried about the whole system and the rot that's kind of run all the way through. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Gates Foundation became incredibly influential in uh, U.S. education policy during the Barack Obama presidential years because the Obama administration had a kind of mind meld around neoliberal solutions with Bill Gates. So they were thinking in the same ways. They quite very quickly aligned their goals and their agenda, and they were working, you know, very closely together, kind of in lockstep, to move certain new educational reforms forward. But this is a problem of capitalism here, because the faster you can accelerate, the more you need a uh, mission, you need everyone to be in on the mission. And it obviously helps to have all of your consultants and advisors down for the cause, as you might say. Some of the way to understand this is just the way that the Gates Foundation builds power through funding a vast network of surrogates. You know, you know, to go back to this example of working on education reform during the Obama administration, if you look at um, Obama's closest advisors, many of them formerly had been grantees at the Gates Foundation or even employed at the Gates Foundation. And so the scale at which Gates works 
it can fund so many different individuals and so many different groups. It allows it to exercise power through really a network of organizations. In his attempts to reform education policy, we see this drive towards what some might call monopolizing instinct. He went for this process of commonality is what he called it, kind of a euphemism for basically saying that all schools in the US should take up the Bill Gates recommended approach to education. Yeah, in the same way that Bill Gates at a certain point realized that the growing computer revolution needed a common language, a common operating system for compatibility, and also that he and Microsoft should be the one that controls that standard, that operating system. Bill Gates brought that same monopoly ethos to his work in education reform, which is that in the United States, you have 50 different states with 50 different education standards. Bill Gates decided, well, these states all need to have the same educational standards and they should be taking similar tests, have similar curriculum, and that that will create a new market for, for example, education technology. If suddenly you have a market of consumers of school kids that are in the you know, tens of millions instead of one million, you have a much bigger market and that's gonna spur innovation and technology. That was sort of Gates' idea for a pretty radical set of reforms that he pushed called these common core educational initiatives to try and create a new, essentially a new operating standards for how U.S. public schools were. The intervention didn't work. It became deeply controversial. Many states abandoned or jettisoned these educational standards that the Gates Foundation undemocratically had advanced. And really big picture, these new educational standards were not shown to improve education. So, you know, it, it's easy to look at this and say, well, Gates failed, but he tried. Um, and what you're not seeing when you do that is all the collateral damage and the opportunity costs, the way that the Gates Foundation can distract us from pursuing other uh, interventions, other solutions that would work better, that wouldn't distract us or distort the public discourse or the public policymaking discourse around education reform. Do you think there's any chance, given that example, that Bill Gates has been a net negative for the world? It's hard to imagine considering the thing we associate Bill Gates with is the saving of millions of children's lives, though you contest the numbers in your book quite robustly. Do you think actually there is an argument to say that if he'd done nothing with his money, we would have been a better place? I think that the Gates Foundation, you know, after writing this book and spending years thinking about it, I think that the Gates Foundation on net is doing more harm than good. Um, you know, these are difficult arguments to make because you're right. You know, the Gates Foundation is administering uh, vaccines which save lives. But the other thing I argue in the book is that Bill Gates himself is the single biggest beneficiary of the Gates Foundation because the tax benefits, the public applause, and the political power he gets. Other people might not agree with the, the place that I land and the conclusions I make in the book, but certainly I think we're long overdue to finally have an open, honest debate about the Gates Foundation that goes beyond the childish fairy tales, one-sided storytelling about, you know, the Gates Foundation, Bill Gates giving away all of his money, that's a fiction, the Gates Foundation being highly effective and efficient, that's also um, something we should question. And, you know, it, the story is just much more complex than that. And given certainly the tax dollars, our tax money going into this charitable enterprise, I think we should all be paying attention. The complexity of that question definitely came to light during the COVID pandemic. Can you just explain to me a little bit about how the Gates Foundation's relationship to the pharmaceutical industry changed over that time? During the pandemic, Bill Gates reached the absolute zenith of his career. And, you know, personally, I don't think he'll ever get to that level of influence again on the world stage. You know, you had a vacuum in global leadership and certainly statesmanship around how do you manage the global pandemic, certainly for the global poor. And Bill Gates stepped into this vacuum and said, you know, I have decades of um, history working with vaccine companies, working on vaccine research, development, distribution. I've got this. Um, so he and his partners promised that they could deliver equity in vaccine distribution, that you know the poorest, most vulnerable people in the world would not be put on the back of the line while rich countries could vaccinate their people. And you know Gates made big promises, but at the end of the day, he did not deliver the vaccine equity. He promised his charitable intervention presided over what became known as vaccine apartheid. So again, it was another failure of the Gates Foundation 
And importantly, there were other alternatives on the table, alternatives that were widely supported. Um, more than 100 nations had petitioned the World Trade Organization, for example, to waive the patents over the vaccine so that they could be uh, more widely manufactured, scaled up, you have a bigger supply, you can distribute those, more people get vaccinated. Bill Gates really doubled down, working with his pharmaceutical partners, he became one of the biggest public defenders and apologists for the patent rights for Big Pharma. Um, and, you know, so he created this massive, uh, highly subsidized by taxpayers distribution mechanism, ostensibly through the World Health Organization to work with and through the pharmaceutical industry to try to negotiate prices and vaccinate the global poor. It didn't work. Um, so, you know, my takeaway is the next time there's a pandemic, Bill Gates is probably should be one of the last people on earth we listen to for advice. It feels like every day we feel closer and closer to the next great crisis. Yeah, and certainly Bill Gates is already thumping his chest saying he is the expert. He wrote a book, um, you know, after a really incredibly poor showing during the pandemic, Bill Gates decided he was going to author a book about how to prevent the next pandemic. So he and his foundation continue to position themselves as a real expert and authority on pandemics. A lot of news media, a lot of news uh, outlets have covered the failures of his charitable intervention in, in the pandemic, but very few have really put much accountability squarely at the foot of the Gates Foundation. Instead, you know, the story is written, these autopsies are written about the failures of COVAX, which was the name of the vaccine distribution program that he helped create and manage. So you know, instead of you know bringing accountability to Bill Gates himself, so I think that's that's that remains to be done. It's a conversation we should still be having. Bill Gates's billions, though, of course, rest on him being an arch capitalist. He had to be an arch capitalist to accelerate Microsoft at the rate he did and to bring it to such public renown. So why do we expect this hyper capitalist to have these kind of values about deciding to? let go of patents. Patents, for example, are a, a brilliant tool of the arch capitalist. Why would we expect Bill Gates of all people to suddenly decide mid COVID pandemic that he's gonna drop his love for the patent? Exactly, we shouldn't expect that. It would be naive for us to think that we should expect that. I think the question that we should be asking is why would we allow this unelected billionaire in Seattle to position himself so powerfully at the center of the pandemic response, both in front of the cameras certainly in the United States, appearing almost nightly on the major news programs as almost a public health expert, even though he has no medical training, no real stand date, no mandate, nobody elected him, but also behind the scenes, you know, with his hands on the levers, negotiating deals with pharmaceutical companies, organizing the pandemic response to the World Health Organization. It's an incredible exercise of power. And yeah, we should definitely question, um, you know, should somebody, you know, he like, anyone else has a you know fairly narrow ideology about how the way the world should works, should we give this much power and influence to one man? How can we expect any degree of innovation to improve our day-to-day -day lives if we don't put it in the hands of these slightly egotistical, perhaps megalomaniac figures? I mean, you can look at the innovations that these men are making, um, you know, and can, and can you look at them and can we honestly say that there's no argument that they are actually helping the world that much? Um, you know, Microsoft software. I mean, probably a lot of us remember this infuriatingly glitchy software that we had no choice about using because it had a monopoly on the market. You know, Facebook, I think, or Meta now we could call it, um, you know, you could look at its impact on society. Certainly you could point to ways that uh, Facebook and Meta has probably brought people together, done some good for society, but it's also created a great deal of harm too. So I'm not sure that I understand the argument that we need billionaires to create this, this technology and this innovation because the vitality of it, the necessity of it, I'm just not sure that that really bears out. I suppose my argument here is that in the hands of someone who is egotistical, perhaps narcissistic, whatever you want to call them, these innovations happen faster because they want to be the philosopher king. They want to be the person who comes up with this thing first and does it best. I'm just trying to get my head around an idea of a world without the prime innovators. But I mean, I guess I would say, you know, that another world is possible. I think maybe we're overstating the importance of the value of innovation in society. 
you know, a lot of the, the innovations that we're talking about, I'm not sure that they're actually driving social progress. I'm not sure that they're actually helping the world. I think we need to question the sort of technology will save us dogma that I think it's, it's very attractive and it's certainly the water we're swimming in. But, you know, there's a lot of, you know, democratic values, humanitarian values that we can consider that sort of transcend, you know, the, the narrow confines of technology and innovation. So, I mean, that's my response, that we could think in bigger terms than just technology. What do you think Bill Gates' worldview could tell us about the way we live today and what our future is going to look like? Well, I'd like to believe that we are ready to reckon with the myth of the good billionaire, that, you know, in, in the, this is an American perspective. I think there's certainly a deep-seated fascination with wealth, if not a kind of a worship of wealth. Um, and you see it in popular culture, you see it in the politics. And, you know, Bill Gates ticks a lot of boxes for a lot of people. It's very, it's a very attractive, almost irresistible hero narrative where this guy became fantastically, obscenely wealthy, and now he's giving it all away. At the same time, there is, at least in the American political discourse, um, a growing and robust debate about extreme wealth. And, you know, Bill Gates has long been the counterpoint to that um, because, you know, unlike the Koch brothers of the world, Rupert Murdoch, um, Bill Gates seemed to be the good billionaire, giving away all of his money. But I think even that narrative at this point is ready for um, re-examination. And I think we are ready for a new debate about Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation and again, using that as a case study for thinking about the next billionaire. Hundreds of other billionaires have already promised to follow in Bill Gates' footsteps to turn their vast wealth into political power through philanthropy. And so that's really the political future we have to think about and the political question we have to ask. Is, is this the world that we want to live in? You raised the issue of journalism here and how truly independent journalism can be when it is at least partly funded by money from the Gates Foundation in many cases, or at least has that awareness in mind of their influence. But now the public square as well, Twitter, the place that would have been beyond the legacy newspapers, is also owned by another billionaire, Elon Musk, even richer than Bill Gates. How is that going to affect this debate that you want to have? Well, it's hard to know what's happening with Twitter and X these days um, because it just seems like such a mess. I mean, if we, you know, there's another layer of that also, which is that, you know, Elon Musk and Bill Gates don't seem to get along at a personal level either. I think it is a problem when so much of our media and social media is run by a small group of extremely wealthy people. Again, it's a very complicated you know, discussion to think about, well, what are the alternatives and how else could we fund the media? How else could we organize social media? But, um, you know, I think there are other alternatives other than just giving more and more of the public square to these billionaires to manage, administer, organize, and or abuse. Well, the billion dollar question, of course, is what is the Tim Schwab solution? If the Bill Gates of the world are doing it wrong, then how do we do it right? I think the big picture long-term political goal is to reorganize the economy and our tax code that you prevent people from becoming this wealthy in the first place. So regulation and taxation, I mean, those are obvious interventions you could make. The problem with somebody like Bill Gates or Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg is that they're already so wealthy. How do you prevent them from turning that extreme wealth into extreme political power, whether through lobbying, campaign contributions, or philanthropy? In the American perspective, they proposed a wealth tax. I think the most aggressive is taking 8% of a billionaire's accumulated fortune every year. That would prevent someone like Bill Gates from becoming richer um, but it wouldn't actually um, diminish his, his existing fortune, currently $116, $117 billion. Unlike Bill Gates, I don't have the confident solution to every problem and the confident answer to every question. But like Bill Gates, I do have a sense of impatient optimism to believe that another world is possible. Uh, I mean, these are long-term political goals. Um, personally, I'm inspired to see a growing debate around the wealth tax, which could be uh, an important beginning for larger structural changes that we could see in, in the economy and the tax code to sort of get at this, this tough problem. Tim Schwab, thank you so much for coming on Unheard. Thank you so much for having me.
So that was Tim Schwab, author of this hefty book, The Bill Gates Problem. Many problems he sees in the life of Bill Gates and his legacy. I'd be fascinated to know what you think of his arguments down in the comments. Do let us know what you think and come back for our next video. This was Unheard.